Hello! Welcome back to Final Fantasy Memories, the series on my channel where I talk about the Final Fantasy games and my memories of them. Which you could probably infer from the title. Uh, and this is Final Fantasy VI Memories, which you could also probably infer from the title. Off to a great start, aren't I? Well, let's not waste any more time because I have a lot to say about this game. Uh, first off... The version I played was this, the Final Fantasy Anthology version, just like with Final Fantasy V. And I know lots of people have bones to pick with this particular version, especially, uh, especially the Final Fantasy VI copy. Final Fantasy V I don't hear quite as much about, but to a certain extent, that's more about the translation issues. And it's because the, uh, the load times are really, really long and the music is really, really bad. My opinions on that is, well... I've honestly never noticed it to be that bad. I mean, it's definitely noticeably different from Final Fantasy II on the Super Nintendo, and I, when I play that, it's definitely a bit slower. I don't know if it makes any difference when I go... I play it on my PlayStation 2, and I always change the disc speed to fast. I don't know if it makes any real difference or if it's just a placebo effect, but it's never really been, you know, like, jaw-droppingly, Oh my god, will the game hurry up! As for the music... Well, apparently 5 and 6 do this a bit differently than 4, on the, I'm talking about the PlayStation emulations. I've heard with 4, they actually streamed, you know, recorded the music from the Super Nintendo version and just played it back. So, which means if you were to stay in an area too long, the music would sort of stop and then start over again, because it's, you know, not actually being generated by... The system is just pre-recorded, and they're like, well, that's why that one sounds so good, because it's, you know, directly from the Super Nintendo, whereas with 5 and 6, they actually have the PlayStation stream the music, and that's why it sounds tinny and terrible. The fact of the matter is, and maybe I'm just not an expert on, on this subject, but I always found that Final Fantasy IV on PlayStation sounded really tinny and, and just kind of muffled, while... I've, I've listened to the soundtrack for these games on, on YouTube and, and from the CD included here as a bonus. And I don't really hear any difference, so whatever. Anyway, this is the closest you can come to the original aside from playing the actual Super Nintendo because it's pretty much just a straight emulation. In fact, in some ways it's closer than the Super Nintendo because it has the Final Fantasy VI labeling. It takes out all the uh, visual censoring. It's still Ted Woolsey's translation from the Super Nintendo version ported straight into it, but just a few minor corrections and, and you know, adding the word die, but it's still basically his translation. So it's kind of funny in a way, so you'll, you know, you'll be walking around town and you'll see the visual element on a building that says pub, and then you walk in and the text says cafe, because they're sort of working on two different levels here. But I don't have a problem with it, uh, in general. Again, I have nothing to compare it to. But what's really special to me about this game, and this is the third time I played through it, this, for, yeah, the, when I played through it for this video, and this is actually my very earliest Final Fantasy memory, and because of that it's very special to me. I mean, I'm, I, I'm sure I probably heard about it at some other point, maybe I saw the Captain N episode where they, they do a Final Fantasy theme, or, or maybe I noticed the Final Fantasy strategy guide and back issues of Nintendo Power for the original game, but I don't really have any, you know, strong connection to either of those if I do remember them. So this is what I consider my very first Final Fantasy memory. So I do want to say, around this time, this is 1997, 1998, I had just moved to a new school district. And um, I just started middle school. And around that time I liked to take, you know, issues of Nintendo Power or Strategy Guys to class with me. And I'd, I'd read them instead of actual books. I, I just enjoy them. And actually, instruction manuals for video games, too. I especially enjoyed the Super Mario RPG Strategy Guide, or Player's Guide, because it was the first RPG I'd ever played, the first thing that introduced me to what an RPG even was. For a long time, I didn't even know what the RPG stood for. But because it was a story, reading the Player's Guide well, wasn't just like, oh, this is how you beat the boss, oh, this is where you find this hidden treasure. Reading the Player's Guide was almost like reading the story of the game. Not quite as good as that, but it was the best I could get. And I found that really exciting. But because, you know, all throughout middle school and high school, you know, so many classes are arranged just alphabetically. And because of that, for a lot of classes, I was always sitting next to this guy named Brian. And he was kind of the same way. He'd always bring strategy guys to school, too. Then later in high school, to bring this to Dragon Ball stuff, his older sister had several of the Daizenshus. And he would 
he eventually started bringing those to school, and I borrowed Daizenshu 2, the story guide from him, and that was so exciting. I had no idea what it said, but I always wished I could own that book, and I would draw pictures from it. But uh, he would bring strategy guides for games I'd never played before, so I first saw Earthbound, or Mother 2. He brought that strategy guide, and I remember learning from that, you know, make sure you have the Franklin badge with you when you go fight the Happy Happy Cult. Uh, and that's one, that's not one of my favorite games. I wouldn't play it for years later. And it's the same thing with this. He had the Final Fantasy III strategy guide, and for some reason, I don't know, I don't know how much he showed me of this, but there was one thing that always stuck out in my mind every single time. I mean, he said it once, but I mean, it stuck in my head for ever since then. I, I gotta think about what I say before I say it. He was showing me the part with the floating continent. And, and how you have a time limit, you know, Kefka has just killed the Emperor and moved the statues around and all hell breaks loose and you gotta hurry back to your airship. When you get there, it gives you an option. Like a shadow, you know, a member of your group, you know, the ninja, hadn't gotten there yet. And it you know, asked, do you, do you want to go ahead and get on the airship or do you want to wait for him? And, and he always t he told me, sage advice, gotta wait for shadow. Those four words always have been stuck in my head. Gotta wait for a shadow. For some reason, that just left a huge impression on me. Because, you know, I really hadn't played many story-based games. Super Mario RPG, pretty much it. I hadn't even played any Legend of Zelda games yet. It was all just, you know, mostly Mario stuff, platformers, jumping around, killing things. It wasn't much of a story to it. And Mario RPG just had driven me crazy, because I always remember you, you could say no to, to joining up with Mallow, and it would make him cry. And I didn't like to make people cry or anything, but just the thought that there are emotions, there are characters, you can, you know, have, have an effect on the way people feel. It, it just, whoa, drama! And, and, and so this really affected me on the same level, where it's like, wow! I, there's the guy here, and I gotta wait for him, otherwise he's gonna die! If I leave now, then he's just, he's gonna die and you never see him again! That's, whoa, my 11-year-old mind was just totally blown! So, I, I, I didn't, you know, I wouldn't play the game for several more years, but I remember coming home from school that day and just sort of making up a, you know, rip-off of Final Fantasy, like, you know, you know, last, you know, last fantasy, I don't know, I made up a bunch of characters with a bunch of stupid names, I had no idea what Final Fantasy even was, but, you know, but there was drama and intrigue and characters dying and making noble sacrifices, and this is the kind of kid that I was, God. And, you know, eventually I, you know, I put it aside and, you know, it was kind of that one thing, but again, gotta wait for Shadow, always stuck with me. So again, it wasn't until a few years later that I got into Final Fantasy. I played 8, I played 7, I played 4, and then, as I mentioned in my Final Fantasy V Memories video, then the Christmas of Final Fantasy finally happened, where, you know, Christmas of 2001, when I was in 10th grade, and I got my PlayStation 2, Final Fantasy Chronicles, Final Fantasy Anthology, Final Fantasy IX, and Final Fantasy X, and, you know, I, pretty much all the games, or most of the games that I hadn't played yet, I had to catch, you know, just go through them you know, for the next year or two. And, uh, you know, as I said there, I really didn't get to play most of the other, you know, I was in five. I was playing, I was playing them in order. Uh, I, I, the only thing I would do is I would play the opening sequence to them quite a bit. So I, so many times I played through the opening sequence of six, going through Narsh and the Magitek armor, you know, in nine doing the, uh, the play, and then in ten doing the, the Blitzball game and the escape from Xanarkand. So those, those things are all probably etched into my memory much more than anything else. Just hoping, oh, I can't wait to really play this game, or these games. And, uh, it was that in the opening cinematic. This, and that's, that's one thing that this version of 6 has that no other one has. And, honestly, all, all the PlayStation emulations have these for 4, 5, and 6. And Chrono Trigger, uh, to get off point. I thought 4 and 5 were pretty... Mm, lackluster, I don't really care for them, but the ones for 6 were actually pretty good, especially the one you get at the end of the game. And I, I love just going back to my, my system save file for this and just watching that video because yeah, the operatic, I mean, the, the actual orchestral version of the opera scene, music playing, uh, and just some really good visuals, and it just really gets me excited about this game. So I want to watch the opening cinematic all over and over again and play the opening scene. I don't think I actually got around to playing Final Fantasy VI until probably spring or, or summer of 2002. And what I really remember about playing it for the first time is that when I, when I got towards the end, 
I, you know, summer vacation had, had happened. I had just finished 10th grade. And all, all my life growing up, every, pretty much every summer or Christmas vacation, I would go to this small town in Mississippi where my, my cousins lived, and I would, I would stay with them for about a week or so. And it's so much, like some of my best memories as a kid are from there. They had a huge amount of land, so many things to play. And I, I'm kind of, I've, I've always been, you know, a city person. And they, they live out in, you know, rural areas. And it was just so exciting. So many, you know, things that I never experienced. So many sort of adventures to be had, you know. And uh, so once 10th uh, grade let out, I went to, you know, my, my usual trip there. And I brought Final Fantasy VI uh, with me. And I remember... Spending a lot of time grinding for levels. There's a really interesting, uh, I don't know if I call it a glitch necessarily, it's just something they didn't really, the programmers didn't really think to block against, called the uh, Vanish X Zone trick. Now, if you don't know what that is, there's a spell in the game called Vanish. It's supposed to be used as a buff for your party. You cast it on yourself, and it makes you disappear. So you can't be hit by physical attacks, but the downside is that it makes you completely susceptible to magic attacks. So you want to use it on, on an enemy who only does physical stuff, otherwise you're going to screw yourself over. Now, the thing was, is that while you're supposed to cast it on yourself, you can also cast it on your enemies. And again, it had the same effect. You can't hit them physically, but again, it means they're susceptible to every single magic spell, including instant death spells like Doom or X-Zone. And it works for almost everybody, including bosses, so you can just really cheat this game out of any kind of difficulty. For me, I would use it in a place called the Dinosaur Forest, which is a forest ostensibly shaped like a dinosaur's head. It's kind of wonky if you ask me. And there's some really powerful enemies there that give a lot of experience points, a lot of magic points. Really difficult to beat. They cast Meteor, but just vanish, X-Zone, gone. And so I remember just spending a lot of time grinding for that. But what, what really made it special for me, and I didn't even know this at the time, is that Later that summer when I come home, I was, you know, 16 at this point. Later on, later that summer I got my driver's license, I was doing more teenagery things. By the next summer, I was in a steady relationship with a girl, even. So, it just stopped being a priority. And so that, that time where I was there playing Final Fantasy VI for the first time, that was the last time I ever had a visit like that, that I ever, I mean, I've obviously seen them, I've been to their house many times since then, but it was never the same kind of, you know, stay over, vacation kind of thing, I've never done that since then. And it's, it's, so it's kind of bittersweet to think about this game, and to think about the, the music, Searching for Friends, which I would hear a lot of while I was playing it then, and it just, you know, has kind of an emotional impact on me to think that, I, it's Final Fantasy VI in a way is kind of the end of my childhood, and, and that makes it really special in that regard. And just, just like with Final Fantasy V, I play it again five years later, around the same time of year, 2007, uh, towards the end of my junior year of college. And, and once again, I wasn't done with it by the time summer vacation started. Uh, and what was special about this one is that my, my fiancé at the time, who was the same girl I just mentioned before, she and I had planned our first ever grown-up vacation we took a trip to Disney World together, and she, she'd been many, many times growing up. I'd never been before, so this was really a big deal for me. And I remember, I think, I think the morning before I left for the airport, I was playing the floating continent. Gotta wait for Shadow! I've always waited for Shadow. I've never not waited for Shadow. That, that lesson is ingrained in my brain. But it was also special because that was the first time I'd ridden on an airplane in... 14 years. I, last time I've ridden on a plane was when I was 7 years old, so this was so exciting for me. I loved being in the airport. I still do. Loved going through security. Yeah, yeah, strip me down. Um, the whole thing was just, just exciting. It was like this, this crazy, amazing place. And being on the plane, everybody generally wants the aisle seats. I prefer the window seats. I wanted to press my face up against that tiny window and see everything. And so when the plane took off, the music that immediately got in my head was the airship music in the World of Balance for Final Fantasy VI. I don't know if I was just playing it then, and that's why it was in my head already, but it just seemed the perfect melody for flying. And to this day, anytime I'm in a plane, I think of, the, of that music from Final Fantasy VI. It really does have some amazing music. It probably has 
one of the best soundtracks of any Final Fantasy game, and that is saying something. But I don't know what it is. I, I, Final Fantasy VI's flying, airship flying, was special because they, for the first time, they sort of made it into a 3D, you know, uh, camera behind you perspective instead of just being overhead. So you'd actually be able to climb and dive on your airship, and you had a full 360 degrees of movement. Uh, doing, you know, using the Super Nintendo's Mode 7. And, and even though all the terrain was totally flat, because it was just sprites, there wasn't any polygons, and even though I played, you know, 7 and 8, you know, later 3D, actual 3D games with polygons, Flying in 6 still just seems like the coolest one of any of the Final Fantasy games I've played. It, it just, it was, it was just fast and exciting, and in the World of Ruin there's that cool sunset in front of you all the time, and it was just, it's so beautiful. It's a really beautiful looking game.